Welcome back to the channel. I just recently finished the preliminary design and detail drawings of our slab foundation for our house build coming up next year. And we are just about to send these out for a quote to some subcontractors in the area. In this video, I'm gonna start at a high level describing why we chose a slab foundation over the traditional basement and also go through some of the design resources that I used to learn how to put this design and these drawings together. We are Alex and Elena. A couple in our mid-twenties working towards financial independence and self-sustainability. Follow our journey as we grow, build, fix, and learn the skills we need to get us there. Alright, let's get started at the very highest level. What is a slab foundation? There are a number of different foundation styles such as slabs, full basements, crawl spaces, pier foundations that all have pros and cons. A slab is among the simplest of these foundations in which concrete is poured directly on a prepared ground surface with footings poured as needed. It requires minimal digging and therefore costs quite a bit less than putting a full basement in. The top reason that we actually chose to do a slab is because of radiant heating. So we're going to be embedding PEX plastic water tubing in the concrete which will circulate hot water through, heat the concrete evenly, and therefore heat the whole lower floor of the house evenly. This works in parallel with the concept of thermal mass which essentially is having a high heat capacity material within your house that stores energy from the day all the way through the night. And it evens out the large fluctuations in energy usage requirements throughout the day and night of any given season. Our house will be south facing with large windows on that face. So in the winter when the sun angle is really low in the sky, we'll be getting a lot of that light in, hitting the concrete, warming up that thermal mass, and that will actually carry through some of the night and minimize our heating needs. However, in the summer, we want to minimize the amount of solar energy coming into the house. So we'll have large overhangs to prevent that. Additionally, we actually like the low maintenance and look of having concrete as our first floor surface finish. So we don't have to spend extra money in first flooring materials such as hardwood or laminate. Granted, we might have to get it polished depending on how the burnished finish of the regular slab turns out, which kind of will offset that cost because concrete polishing is pretty darn expensive. But no matter what, the concrete will be our finished floor surface. And this really helps with the radiant floor heating too. Having no extra barrier between the floor surface and your open air space is better. One last point I want to make about why we chose a slab foundation is pretty specific to just us personally. We really sat down and thought about like, what do people use a basement for? What would we use a basement for? And typically it falls into four categories, a bar, a movie theater, a gym, or storage. Quite honestly, Elaine and I don't drink very much and we don't really watch much TV or movies. So the first two aren't really that important to us. We do like the idea of having a home gym eventually, but we're also going to be building a detached garage in the future, so it's probably going to end up in there. And then finally, storage. We don't really want to have so much stuff that we need in excess of storage. We're going to have unconditioned storage above our garage anyway, and again, we're going to have that detached garage. So with all that said, giving up the extra square footage and potentially the extra house value was worth it to us to be able to do the radiant flooring, have the thermal mass, and save some cost in excavation and raw material costs up front. So with that said, let me walk you through my chief architect model of our foundation and show you the drawings and some of the details that I've made to put in our plans. So here's the model. As you can see, it is pretty simplistic. Uh, it's essentially the garage slab here, the main living area slab, our front porch, and then our back patio. If I pan down underneath, you can see the structure of the stem wall and the footings, and you can see on the interior slab, there is insulation along the stem wall. So it's pretty cool how the program allows you to model all this. This is also the gravel underneath the slab that's going to prepare the ground. A really handy feature of Chief Architect is that it keeps track of all the material usage. So for this model, I just did a quick Excel export while prepping for this video, and I was looking at my concrete material usage it's gonna be about an 80 cubic yard pour between all my footings, stem walls, and slabs on the house. Now I'll go over here into my plan drawing. The plan is essentially the 2D representation of the 3D model that you just saw, and this is what we can actually give to concrete subcontractors that allow them to properly bid out the job. So if I zoom in here, you can just see more of the dimensions that I use, some of the notes, uh, in order to help the guys lay out the forms for these stem walls and this whole foundation. I included some more details that you typically wouldn't see on traditional foundation drawings. Just for my own knowledge, uh, the best example of this is the relief cuts. Having these relief cuts laid out ahead of time 
will help to eliminate confusion when the time comes to actually cut them. The 8 inch thick stem walls rest atop a footing, which is essentially just a wider base wall in order to help distribute the load of the house into the ground. For our size house, which is a two story wooden framed light construction house, these are actually exceeding code values, but the building code really just establishes minimums, so it's really okay if you build better than the minimum. In fact, it's preferred. I lower my porch stem walls four inches from my main stem wall. This is just gonna help with preventing water from coming into the house. And I will pour a slab on top of this stem wall um, right up to basically just under that door recess. One thing I was kind of thinking about while putting all these designs together is I don't really want a lot of big steps up. I wanna make this house wheelchair accessible very easily and I wanna make it really easy to get things like furniture in and out and that sort of thing. You can see where all my door openings are. Uh, this is actually a dropped recess. I think I have a note up here about it. Yeah, three quarter inch step down. So this will essentially serve as my door pan and exterior sills or door pans are required by code. Um, it's essentially what allows water to drain out from underneath the door if it ever gets there. So I'm gonna have that built right into my concrete. You can accomplish this through other means, but I figured I would rather have it done while forming everything up. You can see on the interior here that I have two internal footings. This footing is going to take a column load that is supporting this whole corner of the second floor. And then this footing is underneath a load bearing wall that supports most of the rest of the house. This section here is a large open great room. So there's no walls or structure over top there. The rest of the roof load is transferred through the trusses out to the exterior load bearing wall. So obviously there's a stem wall and footing all the way around the rest of the house. I'm doing a four inch slab in the living space and the porches, and I'm gonna do a six inch slab in the garage. I'll get into the slab details in just a little bit. I wanted a flat surface here for the first six foot, just so if I have any tool benches or anything, it'd be easy to build on a non-sloping floor. And then code does require either floor drains or sloping the garage slab towards the door. So there will be a very minimal fall towards the garage doors to allow any snow melt or water to drain outside the garage. Now I'm gonna show you some cross-sectional views so you can get a good idea of what's going on inside the concrete foundation. This is basically a section of my slab and the lower portion of my wall. Um, so you can kind of see how everything stacks up here. It's nice to do these so that you understand uh, what your finished assembly should look like. One of the biggest things with foundations in general is making sure, well, at least in cold climates, making sure that your footing lies below frost depth. This is one thing I still need to check with my local inspector. I'm pretty sure it's 36 inch men. This is one of those things, it was actually kind of hard to find this in the building code. So definitely check with your local inspectors. It varies everywhere. I know in the really northern climates, it can get up to like four to eight feet or something. So, so you'd be almost silly if you didn't do a basement, if you're gonna build a stem wall that tall. The biggest defense in frost actually is just simply sloping the grade away from the structure that prevents water from accumulating down here by your footings where it would then freeze and expand. And that can create a phenomenon called heaving where the whole, the whole foundation and the whole house is essentially picked up by freezing ground. So that's something you really, really want to avoid and you can do it by digging your footing to the right depth. As you can see, we're doing an eight inch thick stem wall. It's gonna be around 40 inches tall with most of that being inside the ground. And then this note here, the one, one and a half by six ledger, that is this cutout right here. And that is because of my insulation. Um, if you can see this note over here, I'm doing two inch extruded polystyrene insulation, which is rated for ground contact. That's gonna be inset into my slab here so that when I build my whole wall out, that edge of that insulation is not gonna be visible once I put my baseboard on. Moving over to the other side of the slab, one thing I wanted to point out is the compacted soil. This is something that some people might think is overkill, but I really am a proponent of having a solid compacted base. I think there's really nothing you can do better than having a solid base when it comes to preventing cracking in your slab. Um, no amount of reinforcement is gonna prevent cracking in any sort of concrete. So having a solid base will help with everything and, and that comes with compaction. And I actually have a specific note on this that we'll look at a little bit later. There'll be four inches of gravel, which serves as a capillary break. That prevents any groundwater from coming up in and affecting the concrete. On top of my capillary break, I'm putting a 15 mil vapor barrier. This is essentially just a plastic sheet that more or less stops any sort of gases or moisture from coming up into my slab because of course concrete is a porous surface and it will happily absorb and transmit all of that. 
As I mentioned, two inch insulation will be run under and up the edges of my slab. Really important to insulate the edge of a slab and it also really helps to insulate the side of your stem wall here. This essentially prevents heat transfer out of the slab that you've worked so hard to heat up with the embedded radiant tubing. I got this detail from a Department of Energy Foundation handbook. For my actual interior slab itself, I want to do a four inch true measurement, so not three and a half like most four inch slabs actually are. Um, four inch true measurement slab with my half inch PEX stapled down to the foam board here. As far as steel reinforcement goes, this is a giant topic of debate in the concrete world as far as what type of reinforcement is best and where it goes in the slab, but this is basically what I found through my research. I decided to go with number three rebar, which is three eighths inch diameter at 18 inch centers on chairs. So it's actually towards the top of the slab. A lot of people will argue that if you have a load on the slab and it will be in bending, that all the tensile forces will be at the bottom and thus you wanna have your rebar, which is what's the tensile reinforcement of the slab at the bottom of the slab. However, after a lot of reading, I learned that for slabs that aren't seeing heavy forklift truck loads or really large loads in general, such as our interior residential slab, that the reinforcement really only serves to try to mitigate cracking and therefore should be as close to the top surface as possible. You still wanna maintain adequate concrete coverage. I believe in my case, in an interior slab, it's three quarter inch. Even though wire mesh is cheaper than rebar, I didn't select that because finishers are constantly walking on it and getting it properly positioned in the slab consistently is nearly impossible. So resting our number three rebar on two inch chairs was what I went with. And of course, on top of my slab, you can see my preliminary wall assembly. We're using a bit of a different sheathing product. It's called Zip R6. Um, Zip boards have been around for quite a while, but this product actually integrates a closed cell foam insulation on the back and allows you to have a continuous insulation barrier without having to do all the extra details of bucking windows out and going around the house twice, adding paneling. So this is something I'm pretty sure we're gonna use. At this point, um, cost will be a driver too. We're gonna do some stack ups there and see how it shakes out. But for now, this is my wall stack up and this is what I'm gonna roll with. A bit of an energy ceiling detail, which I actually learned from Matt Reisinger's Instagram, was the importance of the air ceiling connection between your foundation and your framing members. There's a ton of leakage that happens here and air carries heat and moisture. So you really wanna minimize it as much as possible. How we're doing that is I'm gonna use the traditional foam gasket sill sealer here, but also a couple beads of acoustic sealant, which is a really rubbery, sticky, caulk-like substance that really never dries out, and it provides a good continuous air barrier at this joint, which is very important. I think on the outside where the sheathing meets the concrete, I'm also gonna use a Sega tape, which is a European product that is really well proven and is gonna be a good redundant air barrier as well at this joint. One other detail I wanted to show was the turndown slab at the garage opening. This area right here is probably gonna be the highest stressed area of the whole house because we're gonna constantly be driving cars up over the edge of this. So having a bit of a thickened slab here kind of helps the case. And I do have the rebar near the bottom of the apron in this example. Gravel driveway is gonna come flush with this step down. This is gonna help with some water drainage. Of course, my slope is coming this way. And for the main slab in the garage, I'm actually gonna be doing a six inch thick slab, again, with the rebar towards the bottom, as this will be seeing a little bit more heavy loads. Here's what those views look like laid out on my plans. And I also wanna go through my notes real quick. This is in the bottom left corner of that plan page. And this essentially just gives some of the nitty gritty technical details of what my specifications are for these contractors. Some of it's redundant from the details, but it's all important. This is that note that I was talking about as far as compacted soil. I wanna use a jumping jack tamper following all excavation to make sure there's no loose soil. And I may even specify a compaction percentage, like 95% is something you might see typically. I have the type and locations of my anchor bolts, grade of my steel, type of my concrete. 4,000 PSI is stronger concrete than typical, but it's something that you can only do once, so I really would rather pay a little bit of extra money for the stronger concrete and not have to worry about things down the road. Slump is another interesting metric of concrete. That's essentially how wet the mix is when you go to pour it. Concrete that has excessive water in the mix is not gonna be as strong as concrete that doesn't uh, as it goes to cure. And even worse is when water is added to the mix during pouring or finishing in order to make it easier to work. That is a definite no-no and that is why I specifically called this out on my plan. That is not to be done. 
Of course, like I mentioned, the slab is going to be a smooth finished surface, so I will probably be paying extra up front in order to get that smooth burnish surface using power trials. And I really wanna make sure that the concrete is cured well before we do any sort of framing. So this is something that I'll probably take on. I won't expect the contractor to come back for seven days, but um, essentially concrete is happy to live its whole life underwater. And actually the process of curing requires water. The slower that concrete is allowed to cure, more or less, the stronger it's gonna be and the less cracks you're gonna have. So I'll make sure that there is some water over the slab for about seven days after placement, and we won't be doing any building on it for almost a month after placement. Speaking of cracking, the last thing I wanna mention are control joints. They're super important because all concrete cracks and having the ability to control where it cracks is just gonna make a better looking slab overall. The American Concrete Institute recommends about a quarter of the thickness of the slab is cut and an early entry dry cut saw, which basically is right after the concrete is strong enough to be able to walk on without leaving indents, to use a dry saw to put those cuts in. At this point in its curing, concrete hasn't developed the internal tensile stresses that cause cracks. So if you can beat the formation of those stresses and put your saw cuts in right after you place the concrete, you're gonna do better. My steel reinforcement in the stem walls and the footings is pretty standard, and that's something that is specified in the building code and local codes. So those are the basic details of our foundation. Again, I'm not a structural engineer, I'm not a foundation designer, but this is what I put together after doing quite a bit of research on this subject. And of course, everything is subject to debate. So if you're a civil or structural engineer that has more experience than me doing this, I'd be happy to hear your input in the comments below. A few of the design resources that I've leaned on while learning how to put something like this together are publications from the American Concrete Institute, specifically ACI 318 and ACI 360, plenty of internet searches on forums such as JLC Online, Fine Home Building, and Green Building Advisor. I've actually learned quite a bit on Instagram through accounts such as Clark Concrete Construction and Matt Reisinger. That Department of Energy Foundation Handbook was pretty important. And finally, actually just going out to job sites. So I, I called around some local general foundation contractors that I'm gonna be sending these plans to for quote, and they actually told me some projects that they're working on right now. One of them happened to be a community of like $5 million homes, so I got to see what half million dollar foundations look like, which are like 180 yard pours and 15,000 square foot houses. So that was pretty interesting, and I was able to take away some good details from those as well. That's all I really had to share about our plans. I'm looking forward to sharing the rest of our design details as I create them. This includes our radiant floor tubing layout, our plumbing, electrical, framing, HVAC, and all of our final finishes. So I hope you learned something. Leave any questions you have in the comments below and stay tuned for next time. Thanks for watching.